Section 11. Listed work. The Minister may, subject to the provisions of subsections 2 and 3, by notice in the Gazette, declare any work under the conditions or circumstances specified in the notice to be listed work. Before the Minister declares any work to be listed work, he shall cause to be published in the Gazette a draft of his proposed notice, and at the same time invite interested persons to submit to him in writing within a specified period comments and representations in connection with a proposed notice. A period of not less than three months shall elapse between the publication of the draft notice and the notice under subsection 1. The provisions of subsection 2 shall not apply if the minister, in pursuance of comments and representations, receives in terms of subsection 2a, decides to publish the notice referred to in subsection 1 in an amended form, and to any declaration in terms of subsection 1 in respect of which the minister is of the opinion that the public interest requires that it be made without delay. A notice under subsection 1 may at any time be amended or withdrawn by like notice. There are certain high-risk types of work that must carry with it specific precautionary measures that are issued by government. Currently, we have no listed work gazetted to our knowledge, but it is reasonable to conclude that hazardous work, such as working with asbestos, would be classified as listed work due to its high-risk nature and need for specific precautionary measures that are issued by government. Regardless of the type of work being performed by an employer, there will be some type of legislation around how to ensure it is done safely. Section 12. General duties of employers regarding listed work. Subject to such arrangements as may be prescribed, every employer whose employees undertake listed work or are liable to be exposed to the hazards emanating from listed work shall, after consultation with the Health and Safety Committee, establish for that workplace a. Identify the hazards and evaluate the risks associated with such work constituting a hazard to the health of such employees and the steps that need to be taken to comply with the provisions of this Act. b. As far as is reasonably practicable, prevent the exposure of such employees to the hazards concerned or, where prevention is not reasonably practicable, minimize such exposure and c. Having regard to the nature of the risks associated with such work and the level of exposure of such employees to the hazards, carry out an occupational hygiene program and biological monitoring and subject such employees to medical surveillance. Every employer contemplated in subsection 1 shall keep the health and safety representatives designated for their workplaces or sections of their workplaces informed of the actions taken under subsection 1 in their respective workplaces or sections thereof and of the results of such actions, provided that individual results of biological monitoring and medical surveillance relating to the work of the employee shall only, with the written consent of such employee, be made available to any person other than an inspector, the employer, or the employee concerned. What does this mean? All employers whose company and employees offer listed work must ensure that a proper risk assessment is carried out. It may be that multiple risk assessments will be needed. There should be a general work-related risk assessment, as well as one for the actual hazardous work such as working with chemicals. Let's say you are going to use thinners in your works. This means that if you have a risk assessment for the job or project, you will also have one for the handling, transportation and storage of thinners. And then you will have one for where the work is going to be applied. Say for instance, working at heights. 
since the dangerous work is going to affect employees, it is also necessary and vital to ensure that the work that they do, as well as the dangerous stuff that they will use, will not harm their health. Employers are responsible to send employees on regular medical checks to ensure that they start off healthy, are working in a dangerous environment without being affected, and then when they are finished the job or perhaps leaving the employment at the company, they are requested to perform an exit medical on that employee. And this is to ensure that there were no residual effects from that dangerous work. This section also shows how important personal medical information is. As section 12.2 shows that the results of this type of monitoring cannot be shared without written consent from the employee. If no consent is given, only an inspector, the employer or the employee can have access to that information. Section 13, duty to inform. Without derogating from any specific duty imposed on an employer by this act, every employer shall, as far as is reasonably practicable, cause every employee to be made conversant with the hazards to his health and safety attached to any work which he has to perform, any article of substance which he has to produce, process, use, handle, store or transport and any plant or machinery which he is required or permitted to use, as well as with the precautionary measures which should be taken and observed with respect to those hazards. Also to inform the health and safety representatives concerned beforehand of inspections, investigations or formal inquiries of which he has been notified by an inspector and of any application for exemption made by him in terms of section 40 and inform a health and safety representative as soon as is reasonably practicable of the occurrence of an incident in the workplace or section of the workplace for which such representative has been designated. What does this mean? While employers cannot remove any liability of duty they have toward health and safety according to the law, and they also need to express what the law requires of employees to be compliant. Thus, the duty to inform is just that. Employers have a responsibility to explain to employees what could harm any employee at a workplace. From the actual task that you perform, to the tools and equipment you use, including high-risk things like hazardous chemicals, dangerous positions like confined spaces, or operating a forklift. When a company has 20 or more employees, they are required by this law, the OSH Act, in Section 17, to elect and appoint an occupational health and safety representative. If this is the case in your company, then the employer is responsible to communicate certain things to the health and safety representative in accordance with this section. These could be things like a department of labor inspector is coming to do an inspection of the company, an incident or accident that occurred, or an investigation into an incident or accident. This would help the health and safety representative to monitor and report back to employees on matters of health and safety. We will discuss this in more detail in section 17 of this act, as well as during module three, describe the functions of the workplace health and safety representative course. Section 14, general duties of employees at work. Every employee shall, at work, take reasonable care for the health and safety of himself and of other persons who may be affected by his acts or omissions. As regards any duty or requirement imposed on his employer or any other person by this act, cooperate with such employer or person to enable that duty or requirement to be performed or complied with. Carry out any lawful order given to him and obey the health and safety rules and procedures laid down by his employer or by anyone authorized thereto by his employer 
in the interest of health and safety. If any situation which is unsafe or unhealthy comes to his attention, as soon as is practicable, report such a situation to his employer or to the health and safety representative for his workplace or section thereof, as the case may be, who should report it to the employer. And, if he is involved in any incident which may affect his health or which has caused an injury to himself, report such incident to his employer or to anyone authorized thereto by the employer or to his health and safety representative as soon as practicable, but not later than the end of the particular shift during which the incident occurred, unless the circumstances were such that the reporting of the incident were not possible, in which case he shall report the incident as soon as practicable thereafter. What does this mean for you as employees? Well, not only employers have responsibilities toward health and safety, but employees also do. And this is the section that helps you as an employee to know and understand what you are required to do. To start, it says that employees are responsible for their own health and safety. Now, this may be confusing because we just discussed all the responsibilities an employer has to provide, such as training, risk assessment, supervision, and the rest. Does this mean that you are now responsible for this? Not at all. What it means is that all the procedures that have been designed by your employer to keep you safe can only keep you safe if you follow them. So it's simple. Your responsibility is to make sure that you know and understand all the safety procedures for your company for your work, your tools, equipment, and materials you use, and then follow these correctly. Let us use the thinners as an example again. When you use or handle this chemical, you are required to wear PPE, or personal protective equipment. Sometimes this PPE can make you hot, or it can be uncomfortable. If you remove the PPE, however, you expose yourself to the dangers of that chemical. But if you wear them properly and keep the PPE in good condition, it will protect you from the dangers. Thus, you have looked after your own health and safety. But this section goes further. It says that you should also look out for the other person who may be affected by your acts or omissions. What does this mean? Well, simply put, the work you perform has specific procedures to keep you safe, like we discussed with the thinners. And if you work properly with this procedure, then you will no doubt protect the person next to you who is working alongside you or perhaps near you. This could also mean that you may need to help the person next to you know the dangers, like using another sign. This picture can help any person, regardless of whether they work for the company or not, to understand that the work involves hazardous chemicals, and this will lead the person to know that they could get harmed by it. In addition to the warning, it also gives a procedure to follow. Eye protection is needed. This means that every person working in that area, not just with the chemical, must wear eye PPE. If you see someone who does not have PPE on, what would you need to do? If you say that you should tell the person to please get eye PPE on, you would be correct. We need to look after each other by also reminding each other to follow the procedures on site. If you do this, then well done. At times, we may not know everything that needs to be done for a job to be safe. Perhaps we know our own procedures, but we are not aware of the procedures for the whole project. If this is the case, we may be asked to do something that we do not understand, like going for another induction, even though we have already had one for our specific job. Section 14.B helps us to understand that our employer and others 
may have a certain responsibility to carry out what is in line with the Yash Act, and they must ensure that we are trained to do something else to be safe. What should we do in this case? We should cooperate with them and help them to fulfill their duty. Let's say for an example that you have a deadline for a job and are working safely like the procedures tell you to. Everything is going well and then you are told to stop working because the safety officer is going to give another toolbox talk on slipping and tripping. You didn't slip or trip and you and your teammates are working safely. So why should you stop working and listen? Well, imagine on another site, there was a team just like yours working, and they also worked according to the procedures. But one of the pipes accidentally broke and started to leak, leaving water all over the floor. Another person walking past did not see the water and slipped on the water, causing them to fall and break their arm. The work on this site had to stop and an investigation for incidents had to take place. Also, the water needed to be cleaned up immediately to prevent anyone else slipping and getting harmed. Would you agree that this is something you should know about? Something that could also happen to you and your teammates? If you know that this type of thing happens, you will be more aware of the dangers and then act if you see something wrong. What should the Toolbox Talk teach you about your safety? Well, we should understand that accidents happen and anyone could get harmed. But if we see a puddle of water, we should clean it up, even if it was not us that caused the spill. If there is a leaking tap or pipe, don't leave it. Clean it up as best as you can and then let your supervisor, manager or employer know. If you have a health and safety representative on site, you should let them know too. Even if no one gets harmed by the spill, it is still a potential harmful situation. And by eliminating it, we can eliminate the broken arm we just discussed. So, it is clear that we need to obey all the procedures set out for our safety. But there is another thing we must do. This is what we have just discussed. If you see something that is unsafe, unhealthy, or potentially harmful, you must inform your supervisor, manager, or employer. Again, if you have a health and safety representative on site, please let them know. Section 15. Do not interfere with, damage, or misuse things. No person shall intentionally or recklessly interfere with, damage, or misuse anything which is provided in the interest of health or safety. Intentionally means that we do something on purpose or deliberately. Recklessly means doing something without regard to the danger or the consequences of one's actions. The law is very clear. We should never do anything to the safety aspects of our work that could interfere with or damage it, and thus it would no longer protect us or others. Section 15 is clear. Never do anything with our safety guards that could expose us or others to harm or danger. We should also never misuse anything that is provided for our safety. Let us look at an example of this. In the picture here, you notice a grinder and we can see all the parts that make it work. One of the safety features of this portable electrical power tool is the movable guard that you can see. Now the meaning of the word guard is a device worn or fitted to prevent injury or damage. Since it is there to prevent injury or damage, it is logical to assume that if we remove the guard, we are exposing ourselves to injury or damage. There have been many cases where this guard has been removed and it has caused injury or even death. 
Section 16 Chief Executive Officer Charged with Certain Duties Every Chief Executive Officer shall, as far as is reasonably practicable, ensure that the duties of his employer as contemplated in this Act are properly discharged without derogating from his responsibility or liability in terms of subsection 1, a chief executive officer may assign any duty contemplated in the said subsection to any person under his control, which person shall act subject to the control and direction of a chief executive officer. The provisions of subsection 1 shall not, subject to the provisions of section 37, relieve an employer of any responsibility or liability under this Act. For the purpose of subsection 1, the head of a department of the Department of State shall be deemed to be the chief executive officer of that department. Reasonably practicable means having regard to the severity and scope of the hazard or risk concerned, the state of knowledge reasonably available concerning that hazard or risk, and of any means of removing or mitigating that hazard or risk, the availability and suitability of means to remove or mitigate that hazard or risk, and the cost of removing or mitigating that hazard or risk in relation to the benefits deriving therefrom. So, an employer, here referred to as a Section 16.1 person, or simply as a 16.1, either called a 16.1 or 16.1, is the person in the company who has the most authority. Generally, this would be the CEO of the company. If a company does not have a CEO, but rather a board of directors, and some of them have the same shares in the business, then a resolution must be drafted in which only one person is nominated and then elected as a Section 16-1. Once this is resolved, then that person accepts responsibility as the employer, as referred to in this Act. This person cannot take any liability away from themselves since they are the 16-1 but they can appoint someone else to take responsibility and carry out the duties that are placed onto the 16.1. We call this appointment a Section 16.2, either called a 16.2 or a 16.2. How does this work? An appointment is drafted that outlines the duties and responsibilities. Then, the Section 16.1 appoints the 16.2 and the 16.2 accepts this responsibility. Even with this appointment, the 16.1 is still ultimately responsible and liable for all health and safety in the company. Section 16.3 states that the CEO or 16.1 may appoint someone else to be an employer in their own right but this can only be done using a mandatory Section 37.2 agreement. We will discuss this in more detail under Section 37 of this Act, as well as in the Prime course under Safety File Management, the Full System, Subcontractor Management. Section 17. Health and Safety Representatives Subject to the provisions of subsection 2, every employer who has more than 20 employees in his employment at any workplace shall, within four months after the commencement of this Act or after commencing business, or from such time as the number of employees exceeds 20, as the case may be, designate in writing for a specific period health and safety representatives for such workplace or for different sections thereof. An employer and the representative of his employees recognized by him or where there are no such representatives, the employees shall consult in good faith regarding the arrangements and procedures for the nomination or election, period of office 
and subsequent designation of health and safety representatives in terms of subsection 1, provided that if such consultation fails, the matter shall be referred for arbitration to a person mutually agreed upon, whose decision shall be final, provided further that if the parties do not agree within 14 days on an arbitrator, the employer shall give notice to this effect in writing to the President of the Industrial Court, who shall in consultation with the Chief Inspector designate an arbitrator whose decision shall be final. Arbitration, in terms of subsection 2, shall not be subject to the provisions of the Arbitration Act of 1965, and a failure of a consultation contemplated in that subsection shall not be deemed to be a dispute in terms of the Labour Relations Act of 1956, provided that the Minister may prescribe the manner of arbitration and the remuneration of the arbitrator designated by the President of the Industrial Court. Only those employees employed in a full-time capacity at a specific workplace and who are acquainted with conditions and activities at that workplace or section thereof, as the case may be, shall be eligible for designation as health and safety representatives for that workplace or section. The number of health and safety representatives for a workplace or section thereof shall, in the case of shops and offices, be at least one health and safety representative for every 100 employees or part thereof, and in the case of all other workplaces, at least one health and safety representative for every 50 employees or part thereof, provided that those employees performing work at a workplace other than that where they ordinarily report for duty shall be deemed to be working at the workplace where they so report for duty. If an inspector is of the opinion that the number of health and safety representative for any workplace or section thereof, including a workplace or section with 20 or fewer employees, is inadequate, he may by notice in writing direct the employer to designate such number of employees as the inspector may determine as health and safety representatives for that workplace or section thereof in accordance with the arrangements and procedures referred to in subsection 2. All activities in connection with the designation, functions and training of health and safety representatives shall be performed during ordinary working hours and any time reasonably spent by any employee in this regard shall for all purposes be deemed to be time spent by him in carrying out of his duties as an employee. Health and safety representatives are employees who have been elected and appointed as a representative of the employees to the employer on matters of health and safety. We will discuss this more in the course Describe the Functions of the Workplace Health and Safety Representative. But in short, a company that has 20 employees must go through the process of nomination, election, an appointment of a health and safety representative, often called SHE-REPS. This stands for Safety, Health and Environmental Representatives. Environment here refers to the working environment and not necessarily the natural environment, compromising of animals, plants and the like. The OHS rep is nominated and elected by other employees and not by the employer. This is done after consulting with the employees and allowing them to nominate persons who they feel would best represent them. Then an election is held. The nominated names of the persons are read out and then one of them with the most votes is elected. For formal and legislative requirements, this person is then appointed using a legal appointment and are given specific duties and responsibilities to carry out on behalf of the employee's health and safety. The appointment should have the date of appointment, the period of appointment, the area, section of or business where the person will be appointed for.
when an employer discusses the nomination and election of a health and safety rep and no agreement is possible, there are arrangements to speak to government to help and intervene in the agreement. Who can be elected as a health and safety representative? Only employees who are employed at the company in a full-time employment capacity and who know the conditions and activities at that workplace. So they must know the hazards and risks of the work being done. The number of health and safety representatives for a shop and office must be at least one health and safety representative for every 100 employees or part thereof. And for other workplaces, at least one health and safety representative for every 50 employees or part thereof. A health and safety representative can perform their duties during normal working hours and should not need to work extra hours to make up for any lost time away from their normal or ordinary work. What does this mean? Well, if you are appointed as a health and safety representative and you are also the team leader, plumber for your team, then when you have a deadline for an installation of a geezer but also need to complete a register for occupational health and safety, then you must be given extra time to be able to complete both your work and your responsibility. Employers must give you what is necessary to be able to fulfill your role as an employee and a health and safety representative. If a department of labor inspector feels that you need to have a health and safety representative even though you only have 10 employees, they may instruct you to appoint one and they are allowed to do this based on their knowledge of risk and potential need for a health and safety representative at your company. Section 18. Functions of Health and Safety Representatives A health and safety representative may perform the following functions in respect of the workplace or section of the workplace for which he has been designated, namely, review the effectiveness of health and safety measures, identify potential hazards and potential major incidents at the workplace, in collaboration with his employer, examine the causes of incidents at the workplace, investigate complaints by any employee relating to that employee's health or safety at work, make representations to the employer or a health and safety committee on matters arising out of paragraph A, B, C or D or where such representations are unsuccessful to an inspector. Make representations to the employer on general matters affecting the health or safety of the employees at that workplace. Inspect the workplace, including any article, substance, plant, machinery or health and safety equipment at that workplace with a view to the health and safety of employees at such intervals as may be agreed upon with the employer. Provided that the health and safety representative shall give reasonable notice of his intention to carry out such an inspection to the employer who may be present during the inspections. Participate in consultations with inspectors at the workplace and accompany inspectors on inspections of the workplace. Receive information from inspectors as contemplated in Section 36 and, in his capacity as a health and safety representative, attend meetings of the health and safety committee of which he is a member in connection with any of the above functions. A health and safety representative shall in respect to the workplace or section of the workplace for which he has been designated, be entitled to visit the site of an incident at all reasonable times and attend any inspection in loco, attend any investigation or formal inquiry held in terms of this act. Insofar as is reasonably necessary for performing his functions, inspect any document which the employer is required to keep in terms of this act. Accompany an inspector on any inspection. With the approval of the employer, which approval shall not be unreasonably withheld, be accompanied by a technical advisor on any inspection and participate in an internal health or safety audit. 
an employer shall provide such facilities, assistance and training as a health and safety representative may reasonably require and as have been agreed upon for the carrying out of his functions. A health and safety representative shall not incur any civil liability by reason of the fact only that he failed to do anything which he may do or is required to do in terms of this act. What does this mean? All health and safety representatives have certain duties and responsibilities to carry out. Based on what we read in section 18.1 and 18.2, there are many duties and responsibilities that can be given to the health and safety representative. The appointment of this health and safety representative must explain what these duties and responsibilities are, but also allow for the time to be able to carry out these duties and responsibilities. It is noteworthy that this person may not have any health and safety qualifications. So what is done now? Well, remember, we discussed Section 8 in this Act, the duty of employers. And under Section 8.2e, it states that an employer must provide such information, instruction, training, and supervision as may be necessary to ensure as far as is reasonably practicable the health and safety at work of his employees. This means that newly appointed health and safety representatives would need to have training to know and understand how to carry out their responsibilities. This type of training, often referred to as competency training, is needed for all legal appointments. Some training can be done in-house, and some will require accredited training from a service provider who has the accreditation. It is vital to know which is needed. As a health and safety representative, you cannot incur civil liability. This means that another employee cannot sue you or take you to court for anything that you may or may not do in accordance with your appointment and duty set out in this Act. Please find the difference between civil and criminal liability in the course Legal Liabilities. Section 19 Health and Safety Committees An employer shall, in respect of each workplace where two or more health and safety representatives have been designated, establish one or more health and safety committees and at every meeting of such a committee as contemplated in subsection 4, consult with the committee with a view to initiating, developing, promoting, maintaining and reviewing measures to ensure the health and safety of his employees at work. A health and safety committee shall consist of such number of members as the employer may from time to time determine, provided that if one health and safety committee has been established in respect of a workplace, all the health and safety representatives for that workplace shall be members of the committee. If two or more health and safety committees have been established in respect of a workplace, each health and safety representative for that workplace shall be a member of at least one of those committees. And the number of persons nominated by an employer on any health and safety committee established in terms of this section shall not exceed the number of health and safety representatives on that committee. The persons nominated by an employer on a health and safety committee shall be designated in writing by the employer for such period as may be determined by him while the health and safety representatives shall be members of the committee for the period of their designation in terms of Section 17.1. A health and safety committee shall hold meetings as often as may be necessary, but at least once every three months, at a time and place determined by the committee, provided that an inspector may by notice in writing direct the members of a health and safety committee to hold a meeting at a time and place determined by him. Provided further that, if more than 10% of the employees at a specific workplace has handed a written request to an inspector, 
the inspector may, by written notice, direct that such a meeting be held. The procedure at meetings of a health and safety committee shall be determined by the committee. A health and safety committee may co-opt one or more persons by reason of his or their particular knowledge of health or safety matters as an advisory member or as advisory members of the committee. If an inspector is of the opinion that the number of health and safety committees established for any particular workplace is inadequate, he may in writing direct the employer to establish for such workplace such number of health and safety committees as the inspector may determine. What does this mean? If a company has elected two health and safety representatives, then they automatically become a health and safety committee. A committee means a group of people appointed for a specific function by a larger group and typically consisting of members of that group. Since there are now two health and safety representatives, they will need to hold committee meetings to discuss between them the complete functioning of all employees' health and safety. What do they discuss? All health and safety related information with a view to initiating, developing, promoting, maintaining and reviewing measures to ensure the health and safety of employees at work. Have a look at section 20, functions of health and safety committees to see how this can be done. All health and safety representatives must be appointed as a committee member and must belong to at least one health and safety committee, as some companies may have many health and safety committees. Take for instance a company with a lot of branches. Each branch may have their own health and safety representatives and health and safety committees. Each branch's health and safety representative would then belong to the one where they report for work. Sometimes you can appoint a person who is not a health and safety representative to be a part of the health and safety committee. If this is the case, then there must always be the same amount of health and safety representatives or more than the non-health and safety representatives committee members. Committee meetings can be held as often as possible, but must be held at least every three months. The format of this meeting must be decided on by the committee members and developed into a health and safety committee meetings agenda and minutes. This is kept as proof of meetings as well as records of the functions being carried out by each health and safety representative. Records help us to see what has happened, what is happening and gives us a good outline to see if we are successful in carrying out our responsibilities. Let us say, for instance, that incidents of damaged tools were occurring at your workplace and the health and safety representative was informed of the incident. Then it happened again. This would be a red flag, wouldn't you agree? Something should be done. If nothing is being done and the incident is going to continue to harm people, you would no doubt want something to be done to protect you. If the health and safety reps in the health and safety committee cannot do anything because they do not know what to do, they are allowed to appoint another type of committee member as an advisory member. This could be because this person has specific knowledge on how to deal with a subject matter and can assist the health and safety reps to keep a high standard of health and safety. These advisory members cannot vote during a committee meeting and can only advise the committee within their specific scope of knowledge. Even OHSS Consulting, as safety practitioners, are allowed to be a part of your health and safety committee and bring their expertise to your company. Anything can be done to ensure all employees are kept safe. Section 20. Functions of Health and Safety Committees A health and safety committee may make recommendations to the employer or where the recommendations fail to resolve the matter to an inspector 
regarding any matter affecting the health or safety of persons at the workplace or any section thereof for which such committee has been established shall discuss any incident at the workplace or section thereof in which or in consequence of which any person was injured became ill or died and may in writing report on the incident to an inspector and shall perform such other functions as may be prescribed a health and safety committee shall keep record of each recommendation made to an employer in terms of subsection 1a and of any report made to an inspector in terms of subsection 1b a health and safety committee or a member thereof shall not incur any civil liability by reason of the fact only that it or he failed to do anything which it or he may or is required to do in terms of this act. The employer shall take the prescribed steps to ensure that a health and safety committee complies with the provisions of section 19.4 and performs the duties assigned to it by subsections 1 and 2. What does this mean? Similar to the individual roles and responsibilities of each health and safety representative, the health and safety committee may make a suggestion to the employer on what to do to encourage, uplift or better health and safety for employees. Although it's the employer's right to choose to act on these suggestions or not, if the health and safety committee feel it necessary, they may send a report to the Department of Labor. All reports once to the employer and Department of Labor must be documented and kept as record. It is also the responsibility of the Health and Safety Committee to discuss any incident at the workplace in which any person was injured, became ill or died. We will discuss what needs to be done more in Section 24 of this Act, as well as in the course conduct an investigation into workplace safety, health and environmental incidents. As a health and safety committee, you cannot incur civil liability. This means that another employee cannot sue the committee or take the committee to court for anything that they may or may not do in accordance with their appointment and duties set out in this act. Please find the difference between civil and criminal liability in the course legal liabilities.